of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Notice, before he goes, he gives commandments to the apostles. To whom he also showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. And I will give you the meaning of that word, infallible. Being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. For, truly, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Notice the sequence there. Witnesses, home, next door, even further abroad. When he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus. Everybody say, same Jesus. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Can I tell you, on the authority of the word of the Lord, Jesus is coming back. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, today, let your presence and uh, grace our uh, ministry here this morning, O oh Lord. I pray that our ears are open to receive what you have given to us. And Lord, help us to feast upon the riches of your word. You're great and greatly to be praised. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated this morning. And Brother Porter has already reflected. Good to have Irma back with us. And good to see the Bellevue grandchildren here today. This is just awesome. All right. Jesus left some things behind for his church. Now, he didn't forget in that sense of leaving behind. He left some things on purpose for them to do the work that he wanted them to do. And what he wanted them to do is written in his will. Anyone know what a will is? <laughs> Not your own stubborn will, but one that's written that's supposed to take effect when you die. I hope if you're up in age especially, you do have a will. I just put a plug in there, okay? It makes things easier afterwards. Uh, you know, it's uh, uncomfortable for people when you get on the subject of death. It's been only a few weeks back. I went into the hospital to see Brother John, and he wanted to talk to me about his funeral arrangements, and I'm so glad he did. It was a lot easier afterwards. Now, death is not easy at any time. But if there's a will in place and arrangements that you want done, it makes it so much easier on the family that's left behind. And so as uncomfortable as the subject is, each one needs to talk about it, and hopefully before that time comes for it to happen. Then after the death, there's a funeral. At the funeral, they usually, this is just form, okay? It's a formal or a formality. They read an obituary. Uh, I always put it in the bulletin. I, I don't read it again because they've seen it in the paper. They see it in the bulletin. I think it's redundant to read it for a third time, take some other time, could be spent something else. So I usually let them just read the obituary. Oh, let's be politically correct. They don't call it that anymore. It's now a legacy of life. In that legacy of life, it even may even mention what they would like to leave behind or how they'd like to be known. Then after the funeral is all over, there's something else. It's called a written will. Now, a written will is usually read to the family after the funeral is over. You know, it's a pretty sick 
sibling that wants nothing to do with the written will. Usually, if I know anything about families, they can't wait to read it. Say, why? They want to know what they're going to get or what they should have gotten and who they'd like to fight with and what's fair and wasn't isn't fair. <laughs> Did you hear me this morning? <laughs> From our text that we read to you in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, you may not have seen a funeral or last wishes here or a will involved, but there is. And Jesus signed it off in verse 11 by saying, I'm coming back. In other words, I dare you to contest it. <laughs> Jesus is coming back to make sure his will is in place and that we have been obeying his wishes. So that puts his written will, it puts uh, the rest of life for those who remain in a whole different meaning. And we better make sure that we are busy doing what he left us to do and according to his will, because he is coming back to make sure we did. So my purpose in preaching this morning is to make us aware what Jesus did put in his will, his written will, read to it by text this morning and then ask you the question, are you living up to your obligations in that written will? You ready? Now, having said that, I'm going to digress here just for a minute, and then I'll get back to my subject. I want to introduce here a subject called change. Change comes hard to most people. I should have had a few amens on that. <laughs> change comes hard to most people because we are creatures of habit. Now, if you don't believe me, I want to consider something here this morning. And uh, I observed the congregation even during the song service, and I was singing too. But those that are here, I'll bet you if I went out in the parking lot this morning, I would see the cars parked in the same spot that they were last week if you were here. I know where you park. Well, let's forget the part. Let's come on the inside. I know where you sat too. <laughs> All right, you're sitting in the same spot you were the last time you were here unless someone got here ahead of you and took yours. Now, there is an exception to that rule this morning. Now, it's funny observing this. Sister Irma forgot where she sits. It's been so long since she's been here. She even asked my wife. She said, where's my Bible? My wife walked up to where she used to sit, and there was her Bible. <laughs> I saw Sister Linda get up and move in a hurry when Wayne come in. <laughs> That's funny, isn't it? <laughs> Hopefully no one would get upset if someone's sitting in, quote, unquote, your spot. Especially if it was somebody new. We rarely like to change even the order of service. Now, we started out with prayer this morning, the preliminaries. The kids took up the pennies. Brother Porter saying, and now we're preaching the word of the Lord, and Hopefully, we'll dismiss in prayer and whatever. Uh, we like an order to things. Routines we get comfortable with, and it's not only like that here at church. It's that way at your house, too. So, yeah, you got a parking spot in your driveway at home, too, and dare anybody else to take it. <laughs> you have your chair in the living room, and... <laughs> And you have your place at the table. And every morning you go through the same routine when you wake up. It's usually a trip to the washroom, back, and when you get dressed, I'll guarantee you, you, you dress the same foot every time first. Whether it's right or left. It, we're just habits of creature and we hate change. A new pastor observed, and one older elder, he said, uh, you know, you've been in church for a long time. There must have been a lot of changes that took place over the years during your stay here at this church. And he said, yep, and I was against every one of them. <laughs> now that I've digressed a little, let me get back on track here. Just keep that in your hat for a little bit. Change, all right? The book of Acts, from which we took our text this morning, tells us in verse 1 that it was about what Jesus began to do and began to teach up until the time of his ascension. Then after his ascension, it tells us what the believers did after he ascended. Now, it would seem in those first 11 verses that the 
Jewish clock or calendar had come to a stop or had quit ticking. Why? Because the grace of God was being ushered in and a church was being born. The book of Acts is a very exciting book. It's the New Testament church in action. So Acts records about Jesus' ascension and also the history of the early church and Jesus' dealings with that early church. When Jesus ascended, he clearly stated something in verse 11 of Acts chapter 1, and that was his will, okay? And then he also mentions later on how he's the head of the church, how he's the hope of every Christian and the help of every Christian. Now this morning, what I'd like to endeavor to do with the rest of this message is show you some things that Jesus left behind in his will that he wants us to do. And I'd like to say that it's stated in his will. And surely we're not children, we're adults. Surely someone doesn't have to come around with a stick behind us to make sure that we do what we're supposed to do or have to be told two and three or four times. If it's written there, it should be automatic. Well, it may not be that way. The first thing that Jesus left for his church How many would like something to be left behind to them from somebody when they die? Yeah, sure. You're honest about that. You'd like something to be left behind. Well, the things that Jesus left behind, we should be excited about, but some aren't that excited. Say, why? What he wrote in his his will was he wanted somebody to continue on his business. Now, what the people would have got excited about is just give me the money. Forget the business. <laughs> you see, they want something for nothing. But Jesus wasn't going to hand it out that way. He wanted his business to continue to expand and to grow. So he didn't give you the money. What he gave you was the opportunity to, let's say, earn the money as the kingdom of God continues to increase. So he left an unfinished business or mission, and he put it in his will. He wants you to continue to grow the business. Is anyone hooked on yet? (laughs) He wants you to grow or to expand the business. Now, to do so means there's going to be an interruption to your schedule. I don't like change. Uh, Now you see how it connects. If we're going to do the will of our Heavenly Father, it means that we're going to have to change our routines, change our habits, change our lifestyles, and get busy expanding the kingdom. Things are different now that he's gone, especially in the light of that he's coming back again. And he tells us three different times in the Gospels and then once in Acts of what he wants us to do concerning the expansion of his business. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, here was some commands that were given just before he he ascended. Right? So he's talking to people about what to do after I'm gone. Let's read it to you. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That's Matthew's account of what Jesus wrote in his will. The second account is in Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. Mark records what Jesus wrote in his will, what he wants us to do after he's gone. He said to them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he, just one verse there? Yep, okay. Luke, Luke also wrote uh, what he wanted us to do after he was gone in chapter 24 and verse 47 of Luke. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And then the account in Acts, chapter 1, verse 8, that was part of our text this morning, but let me read verse 8 to you again. 
He shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon him. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Jesus wanted his people, his church, to know that when he went away, he was leaving behind a job for them to do to continue on the business. He wrote it in his will. And we've got four different accounts of it. He even told us what to say. The manuscript, so to speak, the sales pitch. He said you are to be witnesses. Now, how do we witness? Well, first of all, words of our mouth. That's a witness. Secondly, there's also our conduct. When people see that there's a difference in your life because of what Jesus did for you, that is a strong, powerful witness. So it's not only your words, it's our works, our testimony, and it's also our actions. Uh, people know whether you are warm or cold, personality-wise, okay? Oh, man, that's a cold church. Nobody's friendly. Or that's a warm, inviting church. Uh, they talk to me and they invite me here and do this. So we are witnesses by our words, by our works, and even by our warmness. So he wanted us to know how to go about expanding the business. He tells us how, what to say in witness, in word, and in works. Then he tells us where to do this. He said, you start right where I established it in Jerusalem, but I want you to grow it. Once Jerusalem hears the word of God, you move just next town, okay? And Jerusalem, Judea. And then when Judea gets to hear all the word of God by your witness or your works, whatever, then go to Samaria. Now, Samaria is a neighboring province. It's not just a town as such. And then he even said further, when Samaria hears, then go to the uttermost parts of the world. That's foreign missions. So he left behind in his will what we're supposed to do. And the first one was to be witnesses to the whole world beginning at home, next door neighbor, further abroad, and he tells us what to say by our words and by our actions. So, we've got that as a mandate. Now, uh, are we doing our part of the will? He did go away, and he is coming back. You know, if you're going to do anything for the Lord, the first thing you need to do is be like the turtle. Not in speed, but he sticks his neck out if he's going to go anywhere. Right? And you're going to have to do the same. If you're going to expand the kingdom of the Lord, you're going to have to stick your, neck, or stick your neck out and be willing to do something for the Lord Jesus Christ. How about doing that this very week? I won't ask you if you did it last week. Now that you've heard the word, you're responsible, get busy doing it. <laughs> Correct? All right. So we have a testimony we have our words, we have our work, we have our life. So we need to get busy finishing the unfinished business or the unfinished mission that Jesus left for us to complete or to carry on after he left. Now that's an awesome legacy, and it's actually written in his will, and he's coming back to make sure we did our part. We better be doing it. Second thing that Jesus left behind for his church was a unchallenged message. I like that. Unchallenged message. In Acts chapter 1, verse 3, he said he showed himself alive after his ascension with many infallible proofs. What do we mean by infallible? That which cannot be argued against. It's solid. You can't come against it in any way, shape, or form. And so how did he do this? What was the infallible proofs of him being alive or that he rose again? He appeared in person. He did. He showed himself alive with many infallible proofs. He appeared to the 40. He appeared to the 12. He appeared to 500 at one time. 11 different appearances between his resurrection and his ascension. And he gave them a message. What's the message? I'm alive again. And I'm alive. I'm thankful that the salvation message is not based upon just the death and burial of Jesus Christ. It's based upon his resurrection. Jesus is alive 
and he's alive forevermore. Unchallenged message. Present tense, he's alive and well in the earth today. The life story of Jesus was prophesied way back in the Old Testament as early as Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Right, the, the uh, seed of the womb is going to bruise the, the, the serpent's head. That was prophesied about Christ coming. He began his earthly ministry when he was 30 years of age. He died on the cross, achieving or obtaining redemption for us. Then he rose again from the dead, and then he gave us a job to do. His kingdom or his ministry is extended to the church today. That's where we're at in point number five of his ministry. There's one more step to complete. We are awaiting his return or his arrival when he comes to take the church home to be with him. So that's the phases in Christ's ministry. Christ's kingdom is to be enlarged through the ministry of the church. That's you and I. And what's our job and how do we enlarge it? By telling the good news of Jesus Christ, that he's no longer in the grave. He's risen again. Uh, victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And he longs to give you his spirit to live above sin and reproach and the power of the enemy. Jesus is alive and well. And he's an overcomer. And you can be as well. There's only one God and only one way to be saved. And his resurrection is proof and an infallible proof. So part of his will or heritage or legacy that he left us was a message that's unchallenged. He is alive. The third thing that Jesus left behind for his church was the power to do what he asked us to do and the power to share the message that's infallible. Right? So it's how to put into practice number one and two. And he gave us the power of the Holy Ghost to do that. I asked... Uh, Sister Doris this morning, if she knew a song, she didn't, so I won't attempt to sing it. But it's been going over my mind as I was writing this message. He didn't leave me the way that he found me. He didn't leave me to die in my sin. He left me his Holy Spirit to live within. He left me a brand new man. Wow, think about it. He didn't leave me the way he found me. No, sir. Wasn't content to leave me in my sin. Didn't die there. But he left me his Holy Spirit to live within. He left me a brand new man. Now that's quite a legacy, isn't it? It really is to help us to accomplish what's written in his will. So the power to accomplish his mission and to share his message is through the power of the Holy Ghost. That Holy Ghost on the inside, number one, it convicts you of everything that isn't right so you can get it out of the way. Right? It's more than conviction. It's a helper. Uh, it does many other things, but conviction, I'm thankful for conviction. Uh, even a child, you don't have to tell them everything that they do wrong. They know. So why there's something born on the inside of them. It's, a, it's their connection with the creator to know, hey, this isn't right. And so thankful for conviction. Not only does it convict the those who are saved, it also convicts the sinner of his sin. We must be about our father's business, telling the good news of salvation, that he won't leave us the way he finds us. He wants to put the Holy Spirit within to make us a brand new person. All right? So the Holy Ghost convicts both the saved and the unsaved, and then it has another job. It will also confront when things are not right. And we have the authority of God's word. And with the authority of God's word, he made this promise back in Isaiah. And I didn't put the exact scripture, but he said, My word shall not return void, but it'll prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it to do. Wow, that word is powerful, isn't it? It sure is. And then I, we, the Holy Ghost also works through us in our compassion or our love one for another. The compassion tells us to go and witness, and tell the unsaved, and also to tell those who are saved about the love of Jesus Christ. We need him every day, and we need him every hour. That Holy Spirit within would cause us to put Jesus first, 
others second and ourselves last. Remember that children's chorus, joy, Jesus first, others, or Jesus first, yourself last, others in between, J-O-Y, joy. And as part of the fire department, we, uh, we put others ahead of our own needs and sometimes to our own detriment. Have you read in the paper this week the uh, RCMP? There's six or seven of them, uh, rewards or, or notices of their bravery. Anyone see that in the paper? My brother did back here, so I'm not lying, okay? <laughs> it was news just this week. And I thought, hmm, please forgive me for my thoughts, all right? Sometimes what we call bravery is not bravery at all. It's plain stupidity. And the Lord watches over us while we're being stupid. I mean, you see somebody drowning, who's going to jump in and save them? A firefighter. He's taught that he should put others first, but you know what they also teach us? Throw them a rope. Don't jump in yourself. Because if you do, (laughs) he'll drown you too. But sometimes when the adrenaline is running high, you do stupid things. And we call it bravery. Huh? <laughs> right? Safety first. That's what we need to talk. Safety first. Now, if, if we're going to save a person from drowning, don't jump in the water after them. Throw them a rope. Throw them a safety vest. Okay? Now, Jesus gave us the power of the Holy Ghost to accomplish his mission and to share the unchallenged message. We cannot save the sinner from his sin by jumping into the cesspool with him. We throw him a rope. (laughs) And we draw him ashore that there's a better way to live. How is that? (laughs) Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who wants to give you the Holy Ghost to live above sin. We have the power and the authority to preach it in the word. He wrote it and told us so in his will. The fourth thing that Jesus left the church was an unshakable testimony. What's the testimony? First of all, his living word. He showed himself alive with many infallible proofs. When all else shakes, the word of God will stand forever. The word of God is powerful. It will not be shaken. It's steadfast and sure. It's unmovable. So we have the witness of his word. That's his testimony that's sure and unshakable. But there is something else that should be unshakable as well. It's the testimony that he has when he saved you from your sins and changed your life completely. Now, if he didn't change your life completely, that's a shakable witness, okay? <laughs> but if, he, if you've changed and never went back to the old ways, then that is an infallible testimony, an unshakable testimony, just as sure as God's word. So the greatest testimony is that he lives. The second greatest testimony is your life that's been changed by the power of God. The third unshakable testimony is your works. We're busy doing the kingdom of God. And so let's get busy doing what he calls us to do. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, it said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's a powerful testimony. So Jesus left the church with his written word, but he also left the church with the living word. He's alive, you're alive, his word's alive. Amen. And the fifth thing, man, I'm getting going to be done early this morning. Say amen. amen. <laughs> the fifth thing that Jesus left his church was an unchanging promise. And we find that in the last verse of my text, verse 11. It's the promise of his second coming. Do you know what? I have a firm belief that's unshakable, founded in the word by his living testimony, by his change in my life, he is coming back. Amen. I can believe that. I can know that. Because all the other promises has come true. Look what he said there in verse 11. He said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. He describes to us how it's going to be. 
He left in bodily presence. He's going to return in bodily presence. He left visibly. When he comes back, he will be visible. He left in person. He's going to return in person. He left on a cloud. He's coming back in a cloud. Amen. He left the Mount of Olives, and he's returning to the Mount of Olives. The purpose of his return is take his church home to be with him. I want to be in that number. That is an unchangeable promise. Jesus is coming again. I asked you this morning, do you want Jesus to come for you? I do too. You know one thing that's really going to depend upon it? When he comes back, he'll say, hmm, I left a will. <laughs> this person was to do this and this and this. This one did it. This one didn't. Oh. Scripture asks the question, when he comes, will he find faith on the earth? And when he comes, will he find us so doing? What do we mean so doing? Doing his work. Finishing his unfinished task. Right? Obligations to the will. No, he didn't leave us the money. He left us the opportunity to expand the business. He said, you better be doing it. There's a promise that goes along with it. What's the promise? I'll come back and get you. Wow. So we need to be busy doing what the Lord wants us to do. He is coming back to make sure that we are doing, that we haven't contested the will, that we're not lazy, but doing what he wants us to do. And I'm thankful for the unchangeable promise that goes along with it. We sing in chorus sometimes. He, he's coming back. He said he would. He's coming back again. Praise his holy name. He's coming back again. I want to sing that this morning. Would you stand with me? Jesus keeps his word. So in his will, he left behind an unfinished mission. He left behind an unchallenged message. He left behind the power of the Holy Ghost so that we could accomplish his mission and preach his message. He left behind an unshakable testimony that is his written word and his living word. And he left behind an unchanging promise that he's coming back to receive us unto himself. I like what's written in his will. I really do. And I want to do my part or my obligations for when he comes back again to be with him. So here's the question in closing this morning. Are you an active participant in his will? Or are you looking for something for nothing? <laughs> it's that easy. It's that easy. Oh, he's sweet.